Welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon for Career Comebacks, making the most of your re-entry to the workforce. My name is Kathy Churn and I am a consumer health librarian at East Brunswick Public Library. Today's program is brought to you by the Libraries Just for the Health of It initiative to promote community health and wellness. Our speaker today is Bradley Basker, financial advisor at Morgan Stanley in Boston. Bradley works with clients to help build a sustainable financial plan to achieve their financial and life goals and manage their assets for them. He is licensed in New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Florida, and Texas. Bradley has already delivered free webinars focused on financial wellness and literacy to companies, synagogues, schools, alumni networks, and public libraries, and enjoys giving back to his communities in this way. Please be aware that this talk is being recorded. Please keep your microphones muted and your webcams off. The recording will be available at ebpl.org slash YouTube. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. Our speaker will answer questions at the end of the talk. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to Bradley. Thanks, Kathy. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. It's a beautiful day in Boston. I'm sure it's the same in New Jersey. So it means a lot that you're prioritizing your financial wellness to be with me here today. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, my name is Bradley Basker. I'm a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley. Got clients all over the country, including a few in New York, New Jersey as well. And typically, I like to do this presentation with a female counterpart who can kind of speak to her experience doing exactly what we're going to be talking about here today. She wasn't able to join, so you're going to have to hear from me. Uh, but I do have experience working with clients that have been in a similar situation where they've had to you know, re-enter the workforce and helping think through some of those considerations. So let's kind of dive into the material of what we're going to talk about today. Because according to McKinsey and Company's study, Women in the Workplace from 2020, from 2015 to 2020, representation of women in corporate America is slowly trending in the right direction. And this was particularly true in senior management, where the share of women grew from 23% to 28% in senior vice president roles, and from 17% to 21% in the C-suite, as we call it, so CEO, CFO, COO, et cetera. Now, although the pandemic has halted the advance at present, women's progress in the workplace will hopefully resume as the pandemic recedes. Now, deciding to re-enter the workforce, whatever re your reason was for stepping back, is a big decision, and kickstarting your career after time can feel very daunting. So today we're going to take a look at some considerations surrounding your career comeback, along with ways that workplaces are bringing inclusivity to this often overlooked segment of the workforce. So let's take a look at our agenda for today. We're going to look at three different directions that we can go in. The first, we'll take a look at the financial and emotional impact of returning to work. We'll then dig into how the pandemic is changing the world of work and making it more flexible and possibly more welcoming to working moms. And then we'll finally wrap up our time today talking about how corporate America is actually creating ways for women to rejoin the workforce and how you can best reconnect to corporate life. So let's look first at the financial and emotional impact of returning to work. Education has always played an important role in women's professional development. And according to the Pew Research Center in 2019, Women reached a milestone when, for the first time, there were as many women in the labor force with college degrees as there were men. So that's a great achievement. Now, this may be surprising since women have been earning more college degrees than men for more than a decade, but they were less likely than their male counterparts to actually be in the labor force until now. Now it's kind of more equilibrated. Now, this landmark is significant because educational attainment is highly correlated with income. However, men get a much bigger bump from their degrees than women do. In 2019, the median earnings for college-educated men was $74,900 compared to $50,000, $50,200 for men just overall, not college-educated. Whereas the median earnings for women with a college degree was $51,600 and $34,000 for women overall. So again, $74,900 for men with a degree, 51,600 for women with a degree, 50,000 for men overall, 34,000 for women overall, right? Degree, no degree included. So again, still a ways to go in terms of sort of, you know, decreasing that gap between, you know, what we call the gender wage gap. Now, other factors have contributed to women not getting their fair share. With the pandemic, women's workloads have increased. 
Mothers are more than three times as likely as fathers to be responsible for most of the housework and caregiving. In fact, they're one and a half times more likely than fathers to be spending an extra three or more hours a day on housework and childcare, which equals 20 plus hours a week. Now, women have been carrying the second shift, as we call it, for some time, because as the default caregivers in many families, women in the U.S. have faced greater financial headwinds when stepping out of the workforce, because mothers are 40 percent more likely than fathers to feel the negative impact of child care issues in their careers. And over a 15 year period, women who just took one year off of work had earnings that were 40 percent lower than women who did not take any time off. So let's dig a little bit deeper to see what this actually means. Now, in November of 2017, the U.S. Census commissioned a report called the Parental Gender Earnings Gap in the United States to examine the earnings gap among parents before and after the birth of a child. And the results are pretty staggering. Almost immediately after the birth of a child, a woman experiences a sharp decrease in her earnings. And sadly, those earnings don't recover until the child is nine or 10 years old. And unfortunately, this wage gap between fathers and mothers never really closes. In fact, mothers are paid only 71 cents for every $1 that fathers make. And over the course of a year, that adds up to about $16,000 on average in lost wages. Now, if we were in person, I'd sort of say, uh, you know, raise their hands, how many of you are surprised by this data? And oftentimes people aren't, sometimes people are, but the point is, is there are pretty big discrepancies. And it's pretty understandable because this kind of gender inequity will take time to address. And we certainly aren't going to fix it here today, but I want to sort of call the attention to sort of what we're looking at, you know, in this day and age. Now, there are many other financial considerations that mothers returning to the workforce must weigh. For example, their return to work, you know, means there's a greater demand for childcare, right? Which can be hard to find and it can be really expensive. You know, my wife has been in school. We just had a baby about five months ago. She's been able to take care of the baby sort of because her classes are part time. But come September, She's going to be working in the hospital, and we're going to have to figure out childcare. And having looked at what childcare costs, it almost makes me want to vomit. It's so expensive. It's almost like sending your kids to private four year college education to get childcare. So, in general, right, you want to go back into the workforce, you're going to have to pay for childcare. That's another consideration. And unlike Canada and Europe, the US doesn't subsidize uh, childcare. Now, there's talk that, you know, President Biden in his bill that's coming up might actually make preschool for the ages of three and four free, which would be incredible. But again, not necessarily a guarantee. And the U.S. has kind of left childcare to parents to fund. And so that's why having healthy conversations around money is so important, especially when you're stepping into the work, back into the workforce. So from things like budgeting, you know, with your spouse to negotiating your salary, addressing these financial headwinds head on means you'll be able to have a financial strategy you know, that compensates for this parental pay gap and the expenses that come with it. In addition to the financial realities that can get in a woman's way, there are also attitudes and beliefs that can hold them back. In 1993, someone named Deborah Swiss and Judith Walker interviewed 902 graduates of Harvard's professional schools from the past 10 years. And the women recounted to the challenges that they faced as they tried to integrate motherhood into their careers, and so this maternal wall that we talk about is the motherhood equivalent of the glass ceiling. In this case, it's the inability to advance in a career based on an employer's stereotypes of mother's abilities and their commitment to work. And women continue to face it today, right? That was, you know, almost 30 years ago, but today we're still facing this issue because a study in 2018 by a company called Bright Horizons found that 75% of responders believed that working fathers were more dedicated to their careers than working mothers and 77% felt they were better able to manage their responsibilities without being stretched too thin. Now, women also face what has been labeled return to work syndrome. Now, this is the loss of confidence many women sort of, many that, that worry many women, you know, when returning to work after a prolonged absence. Now, at the same time, they also experience something called imposter syndrome, which is just a mixture of anxiety and, and the inability to recognize their own competence and success. And that makes it harder for them to assert themselves and go back to how they were as a high powered executive or a high powered employee when, you know, before they had to step away, when they come back, they sort of judge, you know, or, or don't necessarily have the self-confidence to be like, I can do this. I used to do this. I'm qualified. This is what I was meant to do. Now, 
when it becomes harder to assert themselves, you know, that makes it decreases their ability to negotiate higher salaries or demonstrate their skills or ask for what they deserve when they reenter the workforce. And so talking about these syndromes and connecting it with a strong social support system can really help boost your confidence and set you up for success when you do reenter the workforce. Now, despite their findings that the maternal wall still exists, the Bright Horizons Modern Family Index found several reasons for optimism. So let's go through some numbers. 91% of respondents agreed that moms can bring unique skills to leadership roles in an organization, right? There's a certain set of skills you learn that I can't even appreciate, you know, because I'm not a woman myself, I'm not a mother, but I can see certain things that my wife has done in the first five months of being a mother that I could see benefiting her back in the workforce. And 85% agreed that being a mother helps a woman prepare for the challenges she will face as a business leader. And 85% also agreed that organizations need more moms in leadership at work. And finally, 84% believe that having mothers in leadership roles will make a business more successful, right? Because there's the concept that more diversity, right, of racial diversity, gender diversity, diversity of perspective, that typically will make a business more well-rounded, have better perspectives, and be more well thought out. Now, the World Economic Forum also thinks that women bring a lot to the table because according to their research, women and men bring different skills and perspectives to the workplace, including different attitudes to risk and collaboration. In fact, women and men actually complement each other in the production process, contributing to greater growth, right? You get these synergies of different perspectives, different ways of thinking, right? Different ways that we're just wired, right? And therefore, the World Economic Forum believes that adding more women to the labor force should bring larger economic gains than an equal increase in male workers. So again, I'm trying to encourage you. There's a benefit you play. Women play a huge role in the workforce. And I don't want to discount that at all. Now, to understand the big picture of what economic gain would look like, the World Economic Forum crunched the numbers. And in countries where gender equality was the lowest, closing the gender gap in the workplace could increase GDP by an average of 35%. And four-fifths of these gains come from adding workers to the labor force, but one-fifth, 20% of the gains are due to just gender diversity, right? So productivity, GDP going up, 20% of it you can just contribute to the fact, attribute to the fact, you know, that's just due to gender diversity. Now, that's some serious cash flow we're talking about and a great reason to jump back into the working world. And quite simply, it's better for everyone when women work. Now, the pandemic has ushered in a new era of remote work for millions of Americans. And according to the Pew Research, most workers who say their job responsibilities can mainly be done from home reported that before the pandemic, they rarely or never telework. Everything has changed. Now we can do more things remotely, which perhaps make it easier to integrate back in the workforce, especially if you've got kids at home or you've been in a position where you've been taking care of kids and it's hard for you to go into the office every day. In fact, only 20% of people said they worked from home before the pandemic, while 70% said they are doing their job from home today, right? And as the, as the pandemic recedes and people get more vaccinated, I do think that that number is going to go down. But, you know, you can see that more than half of those working from home say that given a choice, they would want to continue working from home after the pandemic, right? I know personally, I love working from my bedroom, I've got the comforts of my own home. I got snacks in the kitchen right next door. I, you know, I can be around when my when my baby's up, and I can, you know, stop in for a couple minutes just to sort of say hi. I wouldn't be able to do that if I was in an office. So I can tell you, if I'm not forced to go back in an office, I'm probably going to be going, you know, in maybe two or three times a week maximum. Um, and I really do work like working from home and decreasing the commute. So as expected, the more educated an employee is, the more likely that work can be done from home. It's just the nature of the work, right? If it's a job that involves being at a computer and you can telecommute, it's one thing, right? If you're working more lower wage jobs, like perhaps you work in McDonald's or you work as a cashier somewhere, it's not as easy to work from home. And so you have to sort of take that into account. So the numbers are interesting. 62% of workers with bachelor degrees said that their work can be done from home, but only 23% of those without four-year college degrees said their work could be done from home. So again, if you've got a college education, there's a decent chance your job can be done from home, which would, might make the integration back into the workforce even easier. Now, one of the benefits of working from home has been the flexibility it offers because about half of those who work from home now say that they have more choice of when to put in their hours and 38% said it's now easier to balance work with family responsibility. So the fact that like, again, you can be home for dinner 
right? You don't have to worry about, you know, getting stuck in traffic for an hour because whenever you decide to step away from the computer, it's sort of up to you. No one's monitoring that. You don't have a boss sort of hanging over you. Obviously, you have to get your work done. That goes without saying. But there is sort of a nice work-life balance that you now get working from home. Now, as we mentioned before, many women's workloads have actually increased by the pandemic because without someone to help with childcare, if you weren't comfortable having a nanny coming to the home or you weren't comfortable dropping your kids off at daycare with the virus spreading, you know, half of teleworking parents with children under the age of 18 say it's actually pretty difficult to get their work done without interruption. So it doesn't come sort of for free working at home. It can be tough working at home, you know, if you've got kids around, because again, it's not sort of a, a pure uninterrupted uh, work environment. So again, sort of something to think about. But again, if you want to work from home, it's becoming more and more attainable. Now, while going back to work used to be synonymous with getting out of the house, in the future, that may not be the case. Unfortunately, there are many online tools that have made working from home easier. So eight out of 10, this is a recent study, eight out of 10 adults regularly use online conferencing or video calling, video calling services like Zoom to keep in touch with coworkers. Here today, we're doing this over Zoom. I'm in Boston, you're mo most likely in New Jersey, and here we are you know, chatting today. And so again, we have now these video conferencing tools and the digitization of our society has made it easier to sort of stay in touch with colleagues remotely. And then you've got instant messaging platforms like Slack, and Google Chat, et cetera, that also allow you to sort of stay connected with your colleagues over the last year, and hopefully that will continue. Now, experts agree that the pandemic will have long-term effects on the workplace. Many believe it's gonna actually make the workplace more empathetic, which I think is good, because I think when it comes to, you know, re-entering the workforce, empathy is a really important thing for, you know, like colleagues to have, executives to have, leadership to have, et cetera. For example, that McKinsey study that I talked about earlier found that many companies have made employee mental health and well-being a much higher priority than it was ever before. I'm seeing more and more people are reaching out to me and Morgan Stanley to say, hey, how can we bring you know, these types of seminars to our employees to help them you know, have a better financial well-being? And what can we do to make people less stressed? Right? It's becoming more and more of a mainstay. So according to that report, the crisis we've experienced has created a feeling of solidarity and fostered an understanding among employees. Right, the idea that if someone has to step away to take care of their kid or, you know, take them to the, to the doctor or something like that, or something just comes up because a, a nanny fell through and got sick, there's just a lot more understanding than there ever was before. And so taken together, the study says that these dynamics point to an increased focus on supporting employees as whole people, not just as a statistic, not just as someone that you know, generates revenue for the business, but actual people who have lives, who have feelings and have certain circumstances that make it difficult you know, for them to act the way other employees might. Excuse me. And, and finally, a study on the future of work trends by the research firm Gartner found that more employers were concerned with offering parental leave and pushing for general equality than they had in the past. So again, longer parental leave policies. I know if I can speak to Morgan Stanley, for example, when I stepped out, you know, for, for the birth of my daughter. Originally, I was only going to get a week off. And after talking to HR, they bumped it up to four weeks. And then a couple months later, they actually extended that policy company-wide. So again, I think more and more employers are realizing that, you know, what's a couple weeks here and there for someone to get their mind right, to be more empathetic to people's situations. And so the bottom line is that these trends should help support women get back into the workplace and make that return much, much easier. So what are companies doing to attract and retain women returning to the workforce? And how are they starting to shift, you know, with their changing career attitudes and options? And how should you best navigate, you know, your own personal return? Now, over the last 15 years, companies have begun to recognize that they are missing out on experienced talent because they're not offering what we call an on-ramp for women who want to return to the workplace. Financial service firms in particular, I'm speaking about Morgan Stanley and some of our other, you know, competitors, so to speak, in the industry, they were among the earliest to actually develop return to work programs. And today there are nearly 150 programs out there in a variety of industries, according to a company called Path Forward. So, for example, Bloomberg, you might have heard of, you know, Mayor Michael Bloomberg. He started a business called Bloomberg, very involved in the financial world. They offer something called the Returners Circle Program which is a day-long event for a couple dozen pre-approved applicants that combines career information, coaching, and exploratory interviews. Since 2016, it's hired mid- and senior-level employees in the areas such as sales, data analysis, and research off of this Returner Circle program. 
Similarly, Bank of America hosts returning talent workshops geared towards professionals who want to come back to work and offering advice on interview skills, career searches, along with the opportunity to meet with some of the bank's recruiters. So it sounds pretty helpful, doesn't it? Now, I want to read this quote, and then we'll kind of dive into, like, what does it really mean? This is from Julianne Miles, the CEO of, a, of an organization called Women Returners. She says, the main advantage of a returnship is that it's a trial period for both sides. For returners, it's a soft landing with a chance to refresh their professional confidence and skills and without the pressure to hit the ground running. So a returnship are typically programs that are structured like internships and are open to men and women who have taken a career break of at least two years. And they generally last from eight weeks to six months, depending on the organization. And returners are often able to refresh their skills and organizations can evaluate them as potential employees. Then everyone together, both the employee, the employer, can decide if there's a good long-term fit. And if not, the returnee has at least a more updated resume, right? They can say they've done something for the last six weeks to six months uh, that sort of makes it look like they're not sort of, you know, pick, dusting off the cobwebs. Now, Morgan Stanley itself has something called a return to work program, which makes returnship opportunities available across 16 different business areas offered in nine cities worldwide. And this program has been wildly successful for us. And as a result, we're always looking for ways to further support women returning to the workforce. Now, some companies skip the returnship phase altogether and go straight to direct hiring with new programs that offer coaching and mentoring designed specifically for returnees. UBS, for example, another one of our competitors, they morphed their returnship program that started in 2016 and made it into a direct hire program in 2018. So instead of this trial period, they straight up were starting to actually direct hire people into full-time employment. And since it has, you know, is already hiring 92% of its, you know, returnship applicants, they just figured we might as well just make it a full-time permanent program. Now, what its program does is it assigns a buddy system and an onboarding program that sort of makes sure that you're, before your first day of work, someone's already reached out, you know how things work, you know how to sort of set up your desktop you know how to sort of get your cell phone set up and all the different things, they kind of set up some sort of buddy system to make you sort of feel like it's not day one and you're coming in completely cold. Another business you might've heard of, Ford Motors, they also started a returnship program in 2017, but also trans transferred it into a direct hire program a couple of years later. And they offer participant skills training and assigned mentor and a buddy to help navigate you know, office culture. And I think especially in a remote environment, you know, onboarding remotely, not being able to sort of meet people face to face for however long this pandemic sort of lasts. It's so important that these companies make an effort to make you feel like part of the team, even if you've never met people face to face. Now, employee networking groups or employee resource groups or business resource groups, there are many different names for it, but their purpose is specific. As it turns out, they exist at 90% of Fortune 500 companies and employee networking groups are essentially groups of employees who join together in their workplace based on shared characteristics or life experiences. And so these company-sponsored groups are designed to enhance employee engagement, inform diversity and inclusion across the country, sorry, across the company, and deliver meaningful content and create ways to collaborate and grow through idea sharing and collaboration and, and specifically champion underrepresented voices. So Morgan Stanley, for example, we have nearly two dozen employee networking groups globally, including a women's employee networking group. All right, I've done presentations at Slack where I've worked specifically with what they call their ERG, women's, the Women's Employee Resource Group. But the point is, there are groups at all these different businesses, 90% of Fortune 500 companies, whether it's for a, you know, a Latino uh, resource group or for women or for people of color, or for Jewish people, or for Muslim people, et cetera. These groups are out there, and these employers are sponsoring you. You probably get a budget to put on activities, get together, whether it's a cocktail hour or seminars or things like that, just to bring everyone together. Now, employee networking groups can also be a really good way to learn more about the company. Now, if a company that you're targeting for a job application has an appropriate group, look for an introduction to the group. Figure out if there's someone that you might want to connect with or you have a connection to that group as a way to get into that business, you know, once you're on board, now you'll, again, know a couple of people at the business. You can join that company's, you know, women's employee networking group. And that can bring that sense of community and support at a critical time as you reenter the workforce. And so what also allows you to do is when you join that employee networking group, it means that you can tap into leadership development opportunities. You can perhaps become on the board of that group. 
and it'll sort of help you, again, like I said, reintegrate back into the workforce and feel like you're a part of the team. Now, as we know, most jobs are landed through connections and meaningful connections, but how to make them at a time like this is very, very difficult. I mean, networking virtually can't be all that fun. Now, it's still possible to network, but instead of face-to-face, -face, we have to kind of go online right now. And so if you're not already using LinkedIn, I would say get started. Make it a profile. Make sure it's current. If you have a LinkedIn, but you haven't touched it in 10 years and, you know, your headshot makes it look like you're 25 years old and you haven't updated you what you've been doing for the last 10 years, right? You want to make sure your profile is current and will show up if someone is searching for candidates for a job. You want to make sure that you're presented well. Now, there are a lot of consultants out there that can help you with LinkedIn, but an easy way to get started is just to start commenting on postings, right? When someone gets a new job, for example, or someone has a birthday or someone reaches a milestone, right? Comment on them. Your name will start to be more visible. Your followers will see what you're commenting and you'll just start to become on more people's radars as well as starting to post content. So posting status updates, posting interesting articles in the line of work that you want. So I'm a financial advisor. So I like to post articles about what's going on in the market, but I'll also post things about, you know, my personal life. I just got recently a standing desk. So I've started to stand a little bit more to be a little bit more healthy. So I just posted about that on LinkedIn to encourage other people that feel like they've been stagnant. But the point is on LinkedIn, it's a, just a great way to grow your brand, get your name out there. And as you start to build your contact list, you'll be able to seek out people specifically that you know professionally, that you're friends with, and you can ask them to make introductions at their business. It's a lot easier to get in when you're not just blindly applying to a company, but when someone who's already there can drop your resume in front of HR's desk and say, hey, Let's take a look at this person much more closely. Now, many professional organizations have maintained their groups by holding online events and boosting their virtual communications. So if you can join the Chamber of Commerce or something in your area or some you know, recreational women's group or something like that, that's a great way to sort of get involved with people in the field, start to network, get to know people. Because again, you never know who you shake hands with or who you virtually shake hands with, so to speak, that might be able to make an introduction down the road to get you that job that you're looking to pursue. Now, effective networking means that you're in it for the long haul. So once a contact is made, you have to maintain it. Check in occasionally with these people that you might have gotten coffee with, you might have connected with on the phone, right? Don't neglect your current network either. So people that you've already, you know, have pre-existing relationships with, re you know, circle back with them. Make sure that they kind of remember that you're in the market, you're looking to get working again, and they'll be, on, you know, they'll be looking out for you and you'll be on the top of their mind. Because the pandemic has left many people feeling isolated and understandably so, all right? Many people are happy to hear from a friend. So go on LinkedIn. You might have a couple hundred connections. Go through that list and see who have I not spoken to recently? Who should I just catch up with? You know, again, don't necessarily lead with I'm looking for a new job. Catch up with them, see how they're doing. And then over the course of the conversation, sort of mention, hey, you know, I really am looking to get back in the workforce. My, my kids are now in daycare or whatever. Uh, I, I would love to have a conversation about what you do or how I could potentially work for your business. Now, one of the long-term changes in the workplace that this century has brought about is the rise of what we call the gig economy, which is people working on a series of jobs as independent contractors, kind of like freelancers, so to speak. And companies like it because it reduced their full-time spend on headcount, as well as, you know, the contractors enjoying the flexibility of being able to sort of go after the, the work that they want. And so Gartner Research came out with the future of work trends post-COVID-19, and they found that a third of companies they surveyed were using contingent workers or contractors as a cost-saving effort. So consider joining the gig economy and doing some consulting or freelance work for a business, right? Because when you join that gig economy, it can give you the flexibility to manage your caregiving responsibilities and add some fresh experience to your resume while earning you some income at the same time. So it's not like a full-time permanent job, but you can get kind of gigs here and there. Uh, and that also will help you pay the bills, but give you that flexibility that we talked about. And what it'll do is it'll just help you get in front of new people, help dust off your skill set and get you reacclimated to the business world. So maybe you don't want to sort of jump two feet into the deep end in a new full time job. You get some independent contracting roles. And then when you're ready, you know, you've got a better skill set that's a little bit more refined. And then you say, you know, what, I'm going to pursue something full time. Now, in recent years, college placement centers, you know, one set up for just graduating seniors and perhaps, you know, upcoming juniors and sophomores looking for internships. You know, they've now expanded their reach to include alumni. So the University of Michigan, Bucknell, Colorado State University are among the many that actually promote career counseling that they do for alumni at any stage of life. It doesn't matter if you 
just graduated, if you're 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, you went to that school, they will try to help, you know, figure out what they can do to help you in terms of career placement. You know, for example, the Career uh, Management Center for Alumni at Ohio State offers career consultants, a career management blog, career-related events, Alumni Fire, which is an alumni networking tool for alumni, right, that any alumni can use at no cost or obligation. And the University of Ohio State, just I'm giving it as an example, has more than 200 alumni clubs, 50 alumni societies that organize hundreds of events each year focused on community service, continuing education, networking. So depending on what school you went to, look if there's some alumni group in your area that, again, does events where you can network and find your way. Because one thing I'll say about America, I don't think this is the same in other, in other countries in the world, people care a lot about their alma mater where they went to school. So if you tell someone, hey, I also went to Washington University in St. Louis like I did, right? Their eyes immediately get big and they want to help you out. So take advantage of that alumni network if you went to college somewhere. And so reach out to your college or university. Don't be afraid to ask what support they offer to alumni. And it could make a huge difference in connecting you to the right person, the perfect opportunity that otherwise perhaps you wouldn't have great access to. And while you're there, right, while you're talking to them, see if there's a way that alumni can get access to like a certification or a class that's offered to current students. You know, you've paid your way through college. I'm sure they won't have a problem with you sitting in a class or two to kind of, again, refresh your skill set. And now the rise in women in returning to the workforce has sparked several new companies with a mission to help returners feel prepared and set up for success in search of employment and beyond. And what they're doing is they're cultivating both ends of the returner talent pipeline. It's a win for returners, right? Returners are finding you know, ways to get back in the workforce and companies are looking to hire, especially as we come out of this recession, we expect the economy is gonna start booming again. Companies are looking to hire. If you work with someone who sort of professionally helps set people up or a career coach, it might help you find that perfect job. Now, if you want expert guidance on your journey back to the working world, consider reaching out to companies like Women Back to Work, the Mom Project, Reach Hire, R E C H I R E, or I Relaunch. There's a lot of businesses out there that are specifically all about helping women get back into the workforce after an extended time off. And they're both advisors and advocates, right? The best kind of ally in your return to the workforce. They can tell you what makes sense based on your skill set, but they also can advocate for you because they have relationships at the businesses that they've got relationships at. Now, there are many reasons why you may choose to go back to work. And so it might be perhaps your kids are at school or they've left the nest finally, or perhaps there are social or financial reasons behind your decision to return to the workforce. Because finding a job can be intimidating for anyone, but it may be especially daunting for someone who's been out of the workforce for a few years. You might worry that you're out of touch with your skills or that your skills are out of date. Right? You might even worry that a potential employer won't be able to relate to your circumstances. They might not sympathize or empathize with you know, what you've got going on back at home. So instead of worrying, focus your energy on finding a job that's right for you. Don't be in a rush. Don't hop at the first job that you find that's not a good fit and you're going to be miserable. And so here are a couple tips that you can do to sort of take that next step to reintegrating yourself into the workforce. Number one, first off, potential employees will want to know why you are returning to work. So make sure you know and can clearly articulate what your motivations are. It's also equally important to know what you actually want to do, right? Do you want to return to your previous industry or do you want to start a completely new career? Are you okay taking a lower level position than you had when you left the workforce, right? Perhaps, especially if you're doing something different, it's all the more likely you're going to have to do something that perhaps maybe you even feel like you're overqualified for, but you kind of have to earn your stripes, right? Is telecommuting important for you, right? Is that something that matters? where you want to have the flexibility, or is this a job where you're gonna to have to be sitting at a desk in an office every day? How do you feel about travel? If you're potentially a consultant like I used to be, are you willing to get back on the road and travel potentially four days a week, right? If that's not something that you're up for, then you're gonna eliminate positions that have anything more than 0% travel. Now, once you have a clear picture of what type of job you're looking for, the next thing is just to brush up on your skills. Perhaps consider taking a class or attending a conference, Volunteering is a great way to improve your skills, right? So if there's ways to kind of get back in slowly by doing things on your own volition, not when you're on the company time, it's a great way to kind of brush up on your skill set. Next, you'll want to update your resume and practice interviewing. You know, perhaps a friend or a family member can perform a mock interview with you. If you have a spouse or a partner or you have someone that does this for a living, perhaps they can just give you 30, 45 minutes of their time and just run you through a mock interview and give you that feedback. 
I will say this very importantly. Don't forget to prepare for phone interviews because many companies screen over the phone before doing an in-person interview. So you might be someone that you know does very well face-to-face, but you have to be comfortable also doing it over Zoom or the phone because that's often how companies will do the initial screen. And then finally, the last tip I can give you is network, network, network. Whether it's connecting with people on LinkedIn or joining a professional organization or reaching out to your alumni association, leveraging who you know can make a huge difference in making your job search earlier, uh, make your job search easier, right? I found this in my career, right? The reason I've gotten the jobs I have, right, from internships to working at PwC to working at Morgan Stanley hasn't been because I just applied to the database. I reached out to my network, found someone who made an introduction to someone else, and before you know it, a couple interviews later, here I am working. And so use your network. People are often happy to help. There's a sort of a level of reciprocity, so perhaps you've helped someone in the past. They're going to want to help you out as well. Now, before we wrap up, I'd like to touch on the importance of financial planning as you prepare to return to the workforce, because the best, you know, the type of job that you secure can have an impact on your finances, right? Are you going to be taking less than you were making previously? If you start to work, will your partner perhaps not be working as much anymore? And so as a financial advisor, you know, I can tell you that financial advisors do help determine the best course of action for making the most of your assets, planning for your retirement, you know, providing for your family, and ensuring that your career break doesn't actually break the bank for your family. And a plan can also help you make more informed choices as you navigate your return to the workforce, right? What are you gonna do with your 401k and 403b, 457? Are you gonna be doing the minimum to get the match or are you gonna be maxing it out and thinking through some of those le uh, levers that we talk about? And so navigating those complicated realities of life and family and work and all that can be draining on a good day, let alone adding the stress of complicated financial decisions. So talk with an expert, get sort of your financial picture you know, sort of organized as you start to think about reintegrating to the workforce so that you don't have to sort of have an additional stress of your finances. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, taking time away from your career was a big, bold move, and I respect especially women who've been able to do that to prioritize sort of taking care of family, whether that's their kids or taking care of loved ones or just taking a personal leave of absence. But deciding on a career comeback is just as important. And you're going to have lots of decisions along the way as you navigate, you know, your new career, life, and the evolving workplace, right? Things are probably going to be a little bit different than when you last left the workforce. So no matter how and when you choose to reenter the workforce, the good news is that there's plenty of support and the resources to help. So I want to just say, you know, be proactive, put your fears aside, and jump in with confidence. And I'm confident you'll be very, very well off. Um, I realized I didn't actually put my contact information in a subsequent slide. So Kathy will follow up with my contact information. Uh, for those of you that are interested in reaching out, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. My name is Bradley Basker, B-R-A-D-L-E-Y-B-A-S-K-I-R. Uh, my email is my full name, bradley.basker, morganstanley.com. And uh, again, if you just Google my name, Morgan Stanley, you'll find my website and you can learn a little bit more about what I do and how I help clients. Uh, but at this point, I want to turn the floor back over to Kathy to help moderate some Q&A. So I think that's it for questions. So, all right. So thank you, Bradley, for taking the time to present on this topic and for answering our questions and for doing this financial wellness series with us. So uh, for everyone else, we have some upcoming health programs that you might be interested in. So on Monday, May 24th at 12 p.m., we have trauma and self-care. And this workshop discusses adverse childhood experiences and self-care techniques that you can use in everyday life. On Friday, June 4th at 12 p.m., we have Recognizing Alzheimer's Disease and Ways to Improve Cognition. For more information or to register, check the library's event page at ebpl.org slash calendar. So thank you everyone for joining us for today's talk and take care and stay safe. Okay, thank you.